The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So today I promised I would play through the second half of the tournament that I started last time, so two times ago, but, uh, before Jennifer Shahadeh's guest lecture. Um, but before I start, so, so remember last time we got to the final table? This is essentially the start of the final table. And, um, but before I get into the hands, I want to do a bit of theory first that I've sort of been foregoing so far in this class. And it's essentially what, what's called the independent chip model, or ICM theory. And essentially what it's used for is, in tournaments, essentially the, the, ch the value of chips is essentially non-linear because you're not really trying to just get all the chips, you're trying to last as long as possible and move up the payments. So I want to sort of now formally quantify what this means and how you calculate the EV of your gambles. Um, so far, I think I've just told you, you know, everything I've done so far in this class has been chip EV, and I've told you, you know, just play to maximize chip EV, maximize your expected number of chips, and that's a pretty reasonable way to play. In cash games, it's what you want to do. And in tournaments, it's, it's not a bad approximation. So I don't want everyone after this ICM lecture to think, you know, I got to completely change my playing in tournaments, because that's not the case. Essentially, playing to maximize expected number of chips is a pretty good approximation of how you actually should be playing. But there are some small differences in extreme situations, and I'd like to highlight some of that today. So, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is essentially, yeah, so it's this idea of minimizing risk to stay alive and move up the escalating payouts. So I want to make an important distinction, though. When I'm saying um, we're still trying to maximize our expected amount of money, when I'm saying you should be minimizing your risk in a tournament so that you can move up the payouts, that is, that's different than saying you should, uh, you should minimize your monetary risk. Because I'm still assuming we're trying to maximize our expected money without worrying about risk, but I'm, we're only minimizing tournament risk to maximize your expected amount of money. But I'm not saying we should be overly conservative in a tournament and just trying to move up the money ladder slowly when you should be gambling because it's um, positive money expectation. If you find yourself in this situation, then, you know, if you're trying to play like professionally and just maximize your expected amount of money in every situation, then you should probably play smaller tournaments where this is not really the, where this doesn't occur too often. Um, you know, I can understand in practice, like if you play poker for fun and you made it far in a tournament and, you know, it's like the top, like let's say 50k and there's like 55 left, you know, I can understand why you might not want to make a positive money, ex a positive money expectation play because, you know, you've, you, you've played this tournament, um, you're probably not going to be in this situation that many times in your lifetime, and you just really want to cash like the World Series of Poker Main Event or something. And I think, you know, that's, that's a reasonable life decision. I'm not criticizing that kind of life decision, but um, I'm just saying, but I'm going to talk about all these decisions assuming we're, we don't care about that. We're still trying to maximize expected amount of money. And if you are playing like professionally where you're getting into that situation very frequently, then it is very important to maximize risk in some cases and to maximize your um, dollar EV because you know, in tournaments, you're losing most of the time. You really have to win a lot the times that you do win. You can't be content, like, you, you can't be content because we made, like, $30,000 if we could have made, like, $50,000. So, okay. So what is the exact formula for ICM? So I'm just going to sort of demonstrate how to calculate the value of chips in a tournament uh, with an example. So ICM is essentially a, a formula to calculate how much your stack is worth in a tournament. So let's suppose there's three players left and the payouts are 5, 3, 2. This is a common structure in like sit and goes if you play those, which are like 10 player tournaments. Um, so the statement is essentially your chances of winning the tournament is proportional to your percent of the total chips. And essentially we're assuming this statement is true and we're going to derive from it all the formulas. Um, and the statement is approximately true. You know, there are more advanced ICM calculators that also take into account your position if the stack sizes are rather shallow. Because there are some inaccuracies, because this statement 
it calculates only based on chips, but you know, if you're folding and then you're the button, the next hand, which is the best position, then that's actually sort of a, an entire big blind better almost than being under the gun the next hand. But look, we're, we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to assume your chances of winning the tournament is proportional to your percent of chips. So how do we calculate this? So, so okay, so you can't really do it by hand in practice, but for this example with three people, I'll, I'll show you how to do it by hand. So let's suppose the chip stacks are also 5-3-2. Okay, so the payouts are 5-3-2, and the chip stacks are also 5-3-2 ratio. So, you know, if chip EV equals money EV, then the guy with 5,000, their equity from the tournament should be $5. And the guy in third place, their equity should be $2, right? But this is clearly not correct, right? Because the guy in third place is guaranteed $2, and clearly there's a non-zero chance of them winning the tournament. So clearly their equity is actually more than $2. Right? And then similarly, if you're player A, your equity is clearly not $5 because you're not guaranteed to win the tournament. Right? So it's, it's clear from this example why if you just do chip EV equal, equals money EV, that's clearly wrong. Right? Is that clear to everyone? Um, so how do we calculate it? So, okay, so, this is, so let's calculate it for player C. So essentially what it's saying, your chances of winning, your chances of coming first is 2,000 over 10,000, which is 20%. And then you calculate your chances of coming second, you just condition on each of the other players winning. So conditioned on A winning, which will happen 50% of the time, we assume that our chances of coming second is 2,000 divided by 5,000, which is the remaining number of chips besides player A. Does that make sense? So player A has 5,000 chips. So between you, between you, who's player C, and player B, you've got five, there's 5,000 chips in total, and you've got 2,000 of those. So it's 2,000 over 5,000, so it's 0.4. And then if player B wins, then your chances of coming second is 2,000 over 7,000. So overall, your chances of coming second is uh, 0.4. To, so point, so yeah, so it's just 50% times 0.4 plus 30% times 2 sevenths, which equals 2 sevenths. So then you can calculate your equity is you're guaranteed two bucks, and you have a 20% chance of winning, which will give you three additional dollars, and then a 29% chance of coming second, which will give you an additional dollar. So your equity is actually 289 in this, this, case, this case. It's actually closer to second place than uh, third place. Does that calculation make sense to everyone? So if there's like five players, you know, you just have to recursively condition. You have to condition on player A winning and then go through all the possibilities of who could come second, then go through all the possibilities of who could come third, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's not a calculation you can really do in your head. Um, it's, but, there, but it's quite easy to find a calculator to do it for you. Um, you just Google ICM calculator and you punch it in and and even though, you know, it's not like, like it grows exponentially, but, you know, there's only going to be like nine players. So it's still fine. It won't take that. The, the computer can do it instantly, even for nine, ten players. Okay, so what are some cases where ICM is easy to calculate? Um, so like I said, in cash games, there's no such thing as ICM. Um, you're just playing to maximize expected number of chips. And your goal is essentially, you're sitting down at the cash game looking to get into all-ins, looking to get into favorable all-ins, hopefully winning the, the person who you're targeting with money. Um, and, turn, and in winner-takes-all tournaments, it's also the same. Um, the, you're, cause you're just looking at your chances of winning the tournament and that's always just your number of chips. So you're just trying to maximize expected number of chips. Um, so as a corollary, once it gets down to two players, there's no, no more such thing as ICM. So sort of three is the minimum number of players you need for ICM to be relevant. Once it's two players, it's just maximize your chip EV because there's, there's no sense of, you know, trying to survive in hopes that someone else busts first. Because with only two people, for the other guy to bust, you have to, you have to take all their chips. Um, okay. So what are some mathematical corollaries of the ICM formula? Um, so big stacks have money EV less than chip EV. Small stacks have money EV greater than chip EV. Um, small stacks also tend to have positive chip EV in general. This is something I didn't mention too much, but in general, uh, so you might have seen this if you guys have like been to a casino and played cash games. So like, it, let's say you sit down at, at a table with, uh, in a cash game and everyone buys in for like 100 big blinds. S at some tables, usually they'll allow you to buy in for as low as like 20 big blinds. And if you do this in general, that's going to be positive EV for the guy with 20 big blinds. Um, because there's situations where they have to, 
where, like, let's say they, they have to essentially, sometimes one guy will raise, one guy will call, and then you can go all in, and then one guy will, like, go all in on top of you, and the other guy will fold, and then you'll have, like, dead money. Um, so another thing is early on in the tournament, ICM is irrelevant. You just want to accumulate chips. So like if you you know if you try to do this formula early on in a tournament, what you'll find is essentially the, um, the essentially you're so far away from the money that none of the things really matter. To maximize your chances of even getting to the money, you just want to maximize your number of chips. Um, so where is ICM most relevant? It's most relevant on the exact payout bubble and on the final table. So let me. So roughly speaking, in every t poker tournament I've seen, other than like strange ones that are like winner takes all or satellites, the payout looks roughly like this. So uh, so it's zero. You go in, and once you hit about top twenty percent, is the bubble, and then there's like a jump here where suddenly you get paid. Um, so this is about this is about eighty percent get zero. And then, so here there's a jump, and then it escalates slowly <coughs> until you get to the final table. Uh, final, sorry, I accidentally switched color. Um, final table, and then it escalates really fast. So essentially, you basically, ICM is most relevant at the points where, like, essentially the derivative or the rate of change of the payout is highest, and those points, as you can see, are here and here. So essentially, it matters most at the exact uh, money bubble and in the final table. OK, let me clear this. OK, so yeah, so some more extreme examples of ICM is you have one chip le left late in a tournament when everyone else has thousands of chips. So clearly, this chip is worth a lot more than its value as a fraction of the chips. And you're just trying to survive with this one chip, essentially, instead of trying to win more chips. Um, and in, so maybe, maybe I'll talk about this in a bit. So in satellites, so sat, what satellites are, they're tournaments where you're trying to qualify for a bigger tournament. So essentially, the important thing is, so you know, there will be maybe like 100 players and there will be 10 seats, which means the top 10 get an invite to the bigger tournament and then everyone else gets nothing. So I guess the qualifiers for the MIT series of poker main event are kind of like this. Right? It says you're trying to come, I guess there's other prizes too, but you're essentially trying to come top 10. So this is how that works. Um, and in that case, right, the payout is, the payout is essentially this. So there's not really much incentive to win. You're just trying to be one of this top 10% that gets paid. Um, so that's another case where ICM has extreme importance. And you often find, or not often, but you can often make a case for folding pocket aces pre flop even though it's even though you know it's going to have positive chip EV if you call because it's the best possible hand but because you just really don't want to bust then you actually want to fold aces um, okay we'll talk about this a bit more late, later let's get to okay so let, let's get back to the tournament so this is the final table um, so ICM is going to be quite relevant here and so I as I'm talking through my decisions in the hands I'll talk about sort of the ICM decisions as well Okay, so this is the uh, this is the first hand, or I think might have maybe one orbit passed. But so we we're at the final table. We're right now we're the second biggest stack, and so so yeah, we should maybe look at the stack sizes. So we look around at the stack sizes. So so what do you notice about the stack sizes, or like specifically like how are we doing? How many chips? How many chips do we have? We right. We have quite a lot, right? Yeah. Um, we have quite a lot, but we're not in first place. There's this one guy who covers us. So this pe pan pan Chrissy guy uh, who covers us. So specifically, the thing I'm trying to avoid is getting in a big pot with pan pan Chrissy. Like, um, I mean, let's say he goes all in and I have pocket kings. I'm going to call, but I'm not going to be that happy about calling in a situation where otherwise I should be very happy. Just because, you know, chances are he's going to have an ace, he's going to have 30% equity. I mean, it's still going to be positive money EV to call, but it's so bad if I basically bust right now in eighth place against campaign Chrissy. So essentially, I'm really incentivized to avoid, like, getting in big pots with him. And I'm essentially hoping for some of these smaller stacks to bust so that then, even if I lose a big pot to him, I don't get the low eighth place payout. So, okay. So it's folded to us. We raise here. Um, I think this is one of the weakest hands I, I'm raising from the button. But so far, players have seemed to be reasonably tight. So I'm going to raise, and then I get the blinds. 
Okay. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll skip some hands at the beginning. Near the end, I'll play every hand. Um, this hand we don't play, but I'll try to show the hands where someone busts. So this hand, small blind goes all in, big blind calls. And so small blind wins with 10-2 uh, suited against ace-4, mm -hmm. which is basically great for everyone at the table um, because someone busted. You're always cheering for people to bust, essentially. Um, and I think also both of their plays are fine. So I think small, small blinds play, it looks a bit silly, but realistically, uh, not only does 10-2 suited have reasonable equity when you're called, it's also, the ICM is very, very, very relevant, right? Like this Gerard Docs guy, he, he, there, he's not the shortest. I mean, he is one of the shortest, so he does need to take some risk, but he still really very much would like to bust after I show to H78. So, so he can't call with anything. Um, I mean, with Ace-4, I think that's definitely good enough to call, but let's say they have, like, King-2 offsuit. I think that's a situation I'd normally call if it was, like, not a final table in a tournament, but at a final table where I'm not the shortest and there's someone shorter than me, I would consider folding 10 to sort of king two offsuit here just because um, just because of ICM essentially. All right, so the next hand, so so the so the big blind busts, and then there's no small blind this hand, which is great because we're people are less incentivized to steal, and indeed we get our big blind back. <laughs> Quite nice. Um, okay, so not much happens here. I'll skip forward a bit. Um, okay, this hand, I guess it's quite convenient for us, but it still illustrates a point. So, okay, so, so this guy, he doubled up a bit earlier, right? Now, he goes all in for quite a lot, right? This is quite a big shove, and if you play by my recommendations, I would never recommend shoving, like, this, this many bets. I mean, it's not, it's like 24, it's quite a lot, right? Uh, actually, 23, sorry. It's, it's 23, 23 big blinds, which is like way too much to shove, right? There's no need to get, risk this much. But once again, I think his play is justifiable because of ICM. You know, he doesn't... And so, okay, so let's see what he had. So we call. I mean, here it's a bit different because even if I call and lose, I'm not out of the tournament. And, I mean, even if I, even if I would, would be out, like even if he had 200,000, I'd probably still call with queens. It's just too good to fold. Um... So we beat ace-queen here, which is great for us. But if you look at the play from his perspective again, it actually seems quite reasonable if you think about it. Because, you know, for him, ace-queen is a great hand from this position. It's definitely good enough where, you know, if it was between folding and shoving for 23 big blinds, you would definitely rather, rather shove for 23 big blinds. So, you know, the, the main reason why normally one would criticize his play is because, you know, why, why doesn't he just raise small with ace-queen? Well, understandably, he doesn't really want want to incentivize me to like re-raise or him pancreasy to make a re-raise. He essentially wants to minimize the chances that he has to play for his stack in this hand. And the way he does that is essentially by going all in. Um, so, so, you know, looking, looking at, back at it, I think his play is fine. The only weakness of his play, I think, is it is a bit sort of predictable what his hand is in this situation. Because I think like... If he had a hand as good as pocket aces, then he shouldn't be doing this. He should just be raising small because it's good enough where he's happy getting it in against me or Pam Pankersy. Um, whereas, you know, also if his hand was slightly worse, like ace-jack offsuit, I think is a good example. I think ace-jack offsuit is, is not strong enough to make this all in play with, but you still want to be raising. So I think there's a small range of hands that you want to be making this all in play. It's like, I think it's basically exactly ace-queen offsuit, um, maybe ace-king, maybe ace-queen, ace-king, and then like middle pairs, let's say like between like pocket eights and pocket tens or something. So, so like the only downside of this play, I think is essentially his range here is very predictable. It's going to be like ace-jack suited plus ace-queen and pocket eights through tens or something like that. So. But um, nonetheless, I'm, I think because it's a final table, because of ICM, it's fine. Um, he gets unlucky, though. He runs into queens. Uh, here we get a walk. Okay, so let's see this hand. Um, so I show to uh, raises, goes all in. So we call here. We're kind of deep enough where um, I want to give myself the opportunity to fold if Pan Pancracy goes all in. And we call... And we and and we win. So okay. So I guess I've been running pretty good in this tournament. I just want to point out. Um, 
there is a lot of selection bias here, right? Because I'm gonna, I'm not gonna like play through a tournament where I get all in on the first hand and lose, right? So I mean, I'm gonna pick a tournament that I need to card in. So it's in some sense not the best pedagogical example because there is a lot of like selection um, bias. You know that I'm gonna run very good in the tournament I choose to show you guys, but um, I mean, if it's between that and you know having the class be over in five minutes because I lost, I guess this is this is le this is the lesser of two evils. Um, <laughs> all right, so so here, yeah. So once again, this is a pretty. It's not that big, but it's a it's a seventeen big blind shove, and once again, it's justified by ICM refold. Um, okay, here, queen seven off. Yeah, I shove. I mean, I think it's it's probably barely a. Uh, I think it's pretty close if chip ED equals money EV. Um, it would be a borderline shove with these smallish antis, but given ICM, I know he's less incentivized to call than usual, so all borderline hands I'm going to be shoving, so I do. Okay, so this hand we get king 10. So once again, I just shove. Um, once again, it's, I think, um, I, basically it's hard for them to call if I just shove, and I and be, because of ICM, so I'm essentially bullying him, bullying them. So when you're the big stack, you can sort of bully people at the final table because because of ICM. Um, we do get looked up here though, and we get looked up by Ace Eight, and so he he wins. Uh, I think uh, I'm not going to do an exact calculation because I'm going to do an exact ICM calculation later. Uh, but I would guess his call. I would guess his call is very borderline. I mean, it's definitely it's definitely positive chip expectancy, but the fact that there's this guy with only fifty seven thousand and this guy with seventy thousand, I think I think it's a call. But I think like a six is definitely a fold. So I think it's probably one of the weakest hands he should be calling with. I think a eight is probably too good. He has to call, but I, I think it's very borderline in either case because of ICM. So he he does hold though. So now, so now um, ICM is a bit trickier because now we're smaller. We're getting it all in with any of these guys can really damage us, and there's still like two short stacks that we're kind of everyone is hoping will bust soon. Um, so you know, so in this situation, you know, I could like go all in and bully this Pam Pancracy guy, but um, ICM isn't that relevant. Like I can't. He's not going to fold like Ace Queen if I go all in. So I just give this one to him. Um, yeah, like uh, calling calling is probably bad anyway, but calling I think is especially bad because it just increases the chances of loot like getting in a bigger pot. Okay, we'll skip forward a bit. We'll see this hand. So ace ten. Okay, so ace ace ten off here. So this guy makes it twelve thousand, and I guess I've skipped a bunch of hands, but so Nicholas Brody I think has been very active, and overall I think people have become very active. Everyone's playing a lot of pots. So overall, I, I'm going to put people on wider ranges than I normally do. Um, but nonetheless, here, I still fold ace-10. I think it's I think it's ace-jack I would probably get it in. And um, ace-10 suited, I think I'd get it in. Ace-10 suited is sort of borderline. And once again, you know, once again, whenever there's sort of uh, when you're tied between getting in a smaller pot and getting in a bigger pot, you kind of want to be you want to be folding. So, um, yeah, so like, I guess at a final table, I should make this clear. It's not like you want to fold more. It's sort of, you want to go all in more when you're first to act, but call other people's all ins less. So that's exactly what's going on here. He's already moved all in, and I'm, I'm going to fold to his all in more often than in a normal game. But as you can see, I'm, I haven't really been tighter in every sense, because when I get to go first, I've been actually going all in more often and risking it more often, because I know my opponents are highly incentivized to fold. So anyway, so, so they go all in, I fold here. So Nicholas Brody also folds, which I guess is fine, but it's, um, it's definitely he had pretty good odyssey call there. But once again, yeah, like ICM just makes, it changes things up a bit. Jack-7 suited, once again, it's a pretty big shove, but Jack-7 suited, plenty good enough, and ICM relevant. Uh, pocket nines here, we make it 12,000 on the on the button. So here, I think pocket nines is sort of good enough where I'm happy if one of them rebases all in and I call. So essentially, my strategy here is I'm going to shove like 
all my sort of medium strength hands, and especially hands that don't play well post swap, like these two offsuit. Um, and then I'm going to raise small with some of my uh, hands that are less good pre flop, but better post swap. Let's say like ten eight suited, and also my monster hands like pocket nines that are also reasonable to play post flop. So, so Nicholas Brody calls here, and the flop is Ace Jack Seven with cards. So it's a bad flop for our hand, but it's a good flop for our range um, because I. Th I think, given the way the table was going, I was opening a lot, and Nicholas Brody is very aggressive. I would guess, unless he had like pocket aces, which he might slow play, he would re-raise most. I, I was, re I wasn't like a hundred percent sure confident, but I was reason like I I'd say like maybe eighty five percent confident that if he had an ace pre flop, he would have just went all in pre flop. So overall, I'd still say it's a very good flop for my range because I think he's way less likely to have an ace than me. There's a small chance maybe he he would chicken out with like ace two offsuit and just call, but I, I but given how aggressive he's been, I would be surprised if he did that. So um, so I decided to bet here, and I'm still not sure how good this bet is. So I think at the time I bet because of my logic that he can't, it's really hard for him to have an ace, and so I think the best strategy for me on this flop and in this situation is to just bet 100% of my hands, and he's kind of just forced to fold basically very often because he can't really keep up with an ace, I can just continue betting. Um, that being said though, I do think, you know, if I do decide as part of my strategy to check any part of my range here, pocket nines might actually be one of the best possible hands to check back. So. I think checking back would have been fine. I guess I bet here because I told myself I want my strategy to be bet 100% of my hands, which I did, and he folds, um, which is yeah, which is reasonably smart because he knows that you know I can bet again, and he's going to have to make a decision for all his chips probably, and it's just going to be tough. Okay, this hand uh, be my sponsor goes all in, gets the blinds. Uh, yeah. Sorry, why um, why would you say pocket nines is one of the best hands to check back there? Oh, um, I think it's basically, it's the, I think I, I very rarely get called by worse and I get called by everything better. Like I think he's always calling a jack and usually folding a seven. Like maybe he won't fold seven, eight with some backdoor draws, but I think he'll usually call a jack and maybe he'll call seven sometimes, but I still think mostly it's just, He'll basically fold everything that beats me and call everything that... Sorry, he'll fold everything that I beat and call everything that beats me, basically. Um, yeah, but I, I still decided to bet nonetheless. Just to win the pot there and not give him extra outs if he happens to have like 10 6 suited or something. So, okay, so we'll go through this hand. So, Pancrasy raises. He doesn't go all in, which is kind of curious, but um, LP Mox calls. He calls again, it's checked, and then LP Mox goes all in on the river, takes it down. Uh, okay, Jack's up in here, I guess. I guess so once again, Nicholas Brady raises, and then LP Mox goes all in over him, and uh, wins a big pot. So I guess I do the same for Nicholas Brady. He's been, he's been raising a lot, so pocket six is definitely good enough to risk going all in there. Okay, this hand, uh, so we get ace-jack suited, and I raise from cutoff. So I've been raising fairly to a fairly small size because the antes are smaller. So that's one thing to remember at a final table, is the pots are actually a bit smaller. Because with only five players the ante, the ante, the sum of the antes, instead of normally being 6,000, is only 3,000 in this case. So the big blind has worse odds to call. Um, so Nicholas Brody goes all in, I look him up with Ace Jack suited, D definitely good enough. I mean, also at this point, I, because a number of pots have gone my way, I'm sort of big enough where even if I call and lose this, I'm still, um, I won't be chip leader, but I'll still have a decent amount of chips. Uh, so unfortunately we lose the Ace 8 here, so now we're second place, but we're still doing reasonably well. Um, yeah, so you know, like... Uh, 
I could have I could have just maybe gone all in here. I mean, I guess this guy has a lot of chips, but I could have like raised to a bigger size to disincentivize Nicholas Brody from doing this with a right wide range of hands and then sort of like protecting my stack more from an ICM point of view. But I mean, I'm happy with I think Ace Jack suited is just good enough where I'm happy calling his his all in, which I should have been in this case. I guess he had Ace X, but yeah. Okay, so Jack-10 suited here. So yeah, here I, I just decided to fold. Um, we c I mean, we could consider doing a crazy bluff all-in, but I, I don't think this guy's folding that often. Uh, they made a rather big uh, re-raise preflop from going three times the initial opening. Um, so Nicholas Brody goes all-in here, and they do fold. So Nicholas Brody picking up a bunch of chips. So he just takes it down again. He's been raising quite a lot. So okay, so here we get a raise and a call. So LP, L, LPM box uh, has been raising over other people's uh, opens quite a lot. So he gets called here, but he holds and wins, which is definitely bad news for everyone. Like you know, if I could have, if I could pay ten thousand chips into the pot to have this all and go the other way, it almost certainly would be profitable. Like the amount I should be willing to pay to make this all and go the other way is probably like 25,000. Like it's a ridiculous amount because the, the just the value of having people bust and moving up the payouts is so significant, especially when I'm not such a big stack anymore. Okay, so now this guy, he just doubled up. So yeah, so for the so I guess we were running pretty good, but I'd say in the last two or three orbits, as you can see, a lot of things haven't been that favorable. We've lost some all-ins, and also people haven't really busted. The chips are sort of just being passed around the table, which is basically not what you're hoping for. So King Ten offsuit, we got a walk. We actually so walk just means everyone folds you in the big blind. I think we've actually gotten quite a lot of walks at this final table. So something we can keep in mind if we're trying to play exploitatively later. Queen Jack, go all in, he folds. So 8-7, I guess, LP, LPM box after winning that. So as you sort of notice, the big stacks are sort of the ones who win most of the pots, and this is sort of expected. So whenever ICM is relevant, you would expect that so although the small stacks have a higher chip EV than, sorry, have a higher money EV than chip EV, usually this, the chips get transferred from the small stacks to the big stacks because the big stacks have more license to, you know, go all in first and sort of bully people around. Um, so he takes this one down. Next hand we get jacks here. So Pancracy is actually kind of short now, even though he started the final table as the chip leader because he's lost a bunch of all-ins. He gets it all in here, and we hold, we hold against a six. So there's actually an interesting play here. I, I don't think he should have done it, but this is actually often a good ICM play. So normally I would say in this situation, if you have a good hand, just go all-in because he knows I'm going to call. So with a six, he just went all-in. But often, um, there's this play called the stop and go, which is in practice not very good. Like, I don't think it would have been here, but it's an interesting theoretical concept, which is instead of going all in, he just calls, okay? He calls, and then he basically blindly goes all in on the flop. Like, he, I mean, he doesn't actually have to, but this is what players used to do. Like, and you can do this in live poker. What you would do in this situation is you would say call, and then before the dealer even deals the flop, you would just say all in. And this is a legal play. And the, the point is essentially to, the point is essentially it's an ICM, okay, the justification, which I think is mostly wrong but still interesting, is um, he sort of wants to maximize the chances that I fold. So essentially, okay, this is strictly better, right? Sorry. The fact that, um, the fact that he would call, let me see the flop, and then I get to decide whether to put the remaining chips in. Sounds like it should be better for me than me having to put all the chips in pre-flop. But the main reason why he does this is because he doesn't. He wants me to have an opportunity to fold my cards and avoid getting in a situation where both of us are playing for all, our entire stack. So 
This was sort of the justification for it. So even though you're, you're giving your opponent more information, you're also decreasing the chances that they decide to call to the river card and have more chances of beating you. Um, so, I mean, that justification is correct, but it's just that if you crunch the numbers, usually the situation won't be favorable enough, and usually you don't want to be giving your opponent that extra information. Okay, so, so finally someone busts. We get Jack 7 off again. So here, normally, I think I, I, I would often consider calling this, but I think just avoid... So now the stacks are sort of even for the chip leader, but not by a 10. And I don't really want to get in a big pot here, so I decided to just give it to him, even though normally I would definitely call this. King 7 suited, I make a pretty big all-in for 21 and a half bets from the small blind, and take it down. All right, we'll, we'll see. We'll see all the hands. Um, so we we fold six three suited here. Be my sponsor decided to raise small, which is once again a bit unusual. You usually just want to go all in in a situation where ICM is so relevant, and then Nicholas goes all in and he folds. Jack five offsuit here we fold. Uh, so once again, this guy raises small. So maybe he doesn't really. Uh, want to do this ICM thing and just he wants to play pots. He takes that one down though. And Nicholas Brody. So, so as you can see, it's it's a bit boring. There's not too many hands. I mean, that's sort of what happens when there's ICM because you people don't you don't really want to splash around. You kind of just want to survive in the tournament by risking all your chips once in a while instead of like slowly bleeding your chips in a variety of pots. So once again, queen nine suited, big all in, plenty good enough. Queen seven suited, I decided to open it, raise it up, but unfortunately, um, I guess, I mean, even if just one guy went all in, I'm clearly folding. So they both go all in, and ace king beats kings, which is really bad news for everyone, essentially, because if kings held, then he would have busted, but unfortunately, he doesn't. So pocket eights, I'm raising here. This would have been a gross spot, by the way. I think if if B my sponsor went all in here, I don't know what would have done. It would it would have been very gross because on one hand I definitely don't want to be folding a hand as good as pocket eights, but on the other hand ICM is just so relevant. I think I probably have to fold. So yeah, this is a case where I could have made an extreme, like a very uh, a hero fold essentially. I folded a very good hand if B my sponsor went all in. So King Jack off, we get another walk. Okay, Jack, uh, Jack 10 off. Um, okay, this hand, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what happened and then we'll take a break and then I'll analyze it after. This hand I want to analyze in a bit more depth because I was actually surprised going through the replays looking at how I played this. So uh, LPM box makes it 16,000 and I re-raised to 44,444. Um, so... <laughs> Essentially, I'm. I think this. I mean, I'm not. I. I don't have a great hand, but I think this is one of the. This hand is too good not to make a bluff with, so that I do that. And then he goes all in. And then I think this. This is a very tough spot because my hand isn't good, but when I re-raised, I definitely had the. You know, if this guy had fewer chips, I would have just went all in myself. I definitely didn't re-raise this size, thinking I would even consider folding if he moved on. Um, but so yeah, the reason I, I made this size is so that if this guy went all in, I could fold. But as it turns out, he he folded and he went all in. And then uh, so let's analyze this hand after the break. We'll take like a short two three minute break. Okay, I'll get I'll get started again. So okay, so let's calculate this hand. So I actually decided to go back and calculate this hand from an ICM perspective because ICM is basically very relevant here. Um, okay, so let's see exactly how to do this in practice. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so so uh, okay, so let's first do the chip EV calculation. Okay, let, let, let me first do the chip EV calculation. So I have okay, so uh, you can trust that I copied the numbers correctly. So essentially, there's three possibilities. Okay, there's um, if I fold, this is the amount of chips. This is the amount of chips I'll have. Okay, so right now I'm only caring about chips. 
So if I fold, this is the amount of chips I'll have. If I call and win, this is the amount of chips I'll have. And if I call and lose, this is the amount of chips I'll have. So we could basically do a calculation here where I do, um, essentially it's, so let's say my chances of winning is X. So it's X times, uh, so it's X times how many chips I have if I, if I call and lose, which is 107. I'm going to not write the last three zeros. Plus 1 minus X uh, times 402. Sorry, I did this in reverse. Okay, X is my chances of losing. Um, so, okay, I'm basically comparing this number versus how many chips I have if I fold. Okay, and then essentially I'm just solving for X, right? So, you, so the way I do it is I set these to be equal, and then I calculate X, and that's sort of the break-even X, which tells me what's the minimum equity I need against this range to call. So, okay, so we can do that. So I think it turns out to be, so this formula is equal to uh, the fold minus... Call over. Okay, I'm just gonna. I did it before. Okay, so <laughs> I, this will be easy. Okay, so uh, I I control Z. So it's so essentially it's I had two to one odds, right? I had two to one odds, so it makes sense that I need about thirty three percent equity to call. Um, okay, so how do we do this side? So this is these are essentially the ICM numbers. So essentially the way you calculate this is you Google um, ICM calculator. <laughs> And then you just go to the first one. It's usually quite easy to find. Okay, so it's a bit tricky because you have to put in the exact payouts. Um, so I think at the time they were like 18.5. This this is all as a percentage of the total pot. So um, I forget exactly the numbers, but it was something like this. Okay, and then you type in the four. You type in the stack sizes. So so it takes a bit of time, and you know even if you're fast at this. If you conserve your entire time bank from the whole tournament for this one calculation, you probably have enough time to do it. Because you're going to have like, you'll probably have like two or three minutes of time bank saved up. So you, can, you probably can do it. You have to essentially, right? So there's three possibilities. I have to calculate if I fold, not only how many chips I have, but how many chips everyone else has. And then I take them in, and then I can essentially calculate the value of my stack in terms of as a fraction of the total money in the pot. And then similarly, I do it for the other two cases. And then I calculate the ICM numbers. And roughly speaking, this is my, um, for, from a, these are all, this is all normalized, but these are rough, this is roughly my dollar EV in each of these three scenarios. And if I do the same, uh, if I do the same calculation, I'll find that I actually need 39.6 equity. Okay. Um, does, so, so far, does the calculation make sense to everyone? I didn't do all the steps in practice, but I explained how to do all the steps. So this, yeah, if you're fast, it takes, it still takes like a minute, a minute and a half. But the last part is now we have to open the poker stove. <laughs> now we have to type in Jack 10 offsuit, and then we have to put him on the range. So, so okay, let's just put him on a, so okay, I, I suspect that I'm probably going to have to fold because 39.6% is quite a lot. So I'm going to put him on the loosest, I'm going to put him on the loosest range and see if I have 39.6. Um, so let's say he's pretty loose. So he's willing to gamble with, let's say, pocket fours plus. Um, I mean, another thing to be that's relevant here is I think it looks like he doesn't have fold equity. Like, I don't think when he's going all in here, he suspects that I'm ever folding, or at least he probably thinks I'm calling him the overwhelming majority of the time. So I think he's rarely going to turn up a stone bluff like 8-7 suited because of this. So I, I, would, I, would, I would be very surprised if he ever had 8-7 suited, um, unless he was somehow, unless he read into this and realized that I could actually fold some hands here. Um, which maybe he did. I, uh, to, I should give him enough credit. So, uh, okay, let's just do something somewhat quick. Let's say he call, he gets it in with ace eight off suit, ace five suited plus, king jack suited, king queen off, and pocket fours plus. So that's like 14.6% of hands. So let's do this. So against this, we have, we have 36% equity. So that's not enough. We need 39. Let's see how wide his range has to be for us to have 39. All right, let's say he gets it in with 20% of hands, which is quite a lot, which is, I think, way too much. Uh, <laughs> let's say 18.6% of hands. Oh, we actually have worse against this range because it has, oops, because it has more hands that dominate us because I put in a lot of hands like King-10 and removed a lot of the hands like Ace-4. So, um, 
basically, okay, you can play with it however you want, but I think it's hard to play with it in a way to give yourself 39% equity. Um, yeah, unless you were very optimistic about how wide his range was. So, in either case, so, so at the time I did fold, and it looked weird to me at first, but after analyzing it, I think this is definitely the right play if you take into account ICM. So I think it's a good example of ICM because if you remember, like the when we were playing with it, our equity was always essentially between 33 and 39. Like if we put them on a looser range, our equity would be like 37, and if we put them on a tighter range, our equity would be like 34. But basically, it's all it's a situation where I would always call if ICM was not relevant, and always fold if ICM was relevant, and. Um, and this isn't even a case where it looks like ICM should be that relevant, but I guess, yeah, so we do fold. So, so you know, with hindsight, maybe my initial strategy was wrong. Like, maybe I should have should not have even bluffed here. Maybe I should have just folded in the first place. That's that's a different story, but, but given that I did bluff, I think the best thing I can do here is fold. Uh, okay, let me just jump, jump back to the PowerPoint for a bit. Um, so I, I just want to talk about a bit more about this theory of uh, sort of satellites and going all in first. So in game theory, this is sort of called the traffic intersection game. So ICM does not say play tighter. It allows you to play looser if you can go all in first. So this is where it's, I actually think it's very interesting because in satellites, you want to be under the gun, right? So normally in, in poker, that's sort of the worst position because you've got to act first. Everyone else gets to act, act after you. But in satellites, basically, you just want to be the first person to be able to threaten, say, look, I'm putting all my chips in. You pretty much have to fold. And that's, so in satellites, let's say there's 11 people left and 10 people get a seat. If you go all in, no one can call you even if they have aces because if you because to, to call you, they essentially need to be more than 10 11ths sure that they're going to win the hand. And even if they have pocket aces, they're not going to be 10 11ths sure that they, they're going to win the hand. So basically going all in first is very, very good. It's essentially like a, so it's called the traffic intersection game because you can imagine the situation where there's like two cars trying to pass each other at an intersection and you sort of want to save time and pass, get there first but you're worried that the other guy might crash, right? You don't yet, both players really want to avoid an accident, but both players really want to be the guy to get through first. Well, if you can act first, and if you just tell the guy, look, I'm like closing my eyes, I'm tying up my hands, I cannot stop my car, okay? I'm just gonna go through the intersection no matter what, right? If you're the first person to be able to do this, then the other guy, he's like, okay, I guess I gotta stop my car now and let you go first, right? That's essentially what it's like. If you're the first person to go all in, and you already said, look, I'm all in, and there's nothing I can do to take my chips back, then the other guy's like, all right, I guess I'll fold and you can win the blinds. So. It's sort of how it works. I mean, of course, some opponents are not rational, right? If you do this enough times, he might be like, okay, screw this. I'm just going to kill this guy and speed up him, right? So, so it, it's a bit weird. And, you know, in practice, this happens a lot, too. I've definitely had very bad situations where, you know, I'm going all in with any two cards, and I know this is a game theoretically optimal strategy, but my opponent's just sped up. And then he calls me with, like, ace jack or something and then i have like jack two offsuit and he looks like a genius and he beats me when his play is just like terrible basically uh, yeah yeah so interesting so does it matter if say you're under the gun and you're in the low stack and you do this right right so the stack size does matter yeah so i'm assuming if everyone had the same stack size in that extreme example where i said other people should fold aces i'm assuming everyone has the same stack size i guess where's the balance between knocking you out versus the chip stack, like the chips differential Right, right, exactly. So, so the reason in that case where it's correct to fold aces is because, like, let's say they call and knock me out, it doesn't help them that much because first place in a satellite does not get paid any more than tenth place. Okay. But in real tournaments, you basically never fold aces because even if you're risking losing all your money, just first place will be higher than second place by enough. And winning with those aces will increase your chances of coming first by so much that you should just gamble anyway. Sure. But um, so this is only in satellites. Yeah. Please don't fold aces in like a uh, normal poker tournament. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you short stack in a satellite or like one of the shorter stacks, um, does going all in still make sense because people can call you without risking their tournament? Right. Exactly. So in that case, you actually need a good hand to go all in. Like you actually need to have positive chip EV as well to go all in. Yeah. So that's why 
when ICM is relevant, the small stacks win and the big, sorry, the small stacks lose and the big stacks win. Because the big stacks have more license to bully the small stacks around, whereas the small stacks can't. Yeah. Because the big stacks can call them more often. And, and also, does it matter if other people have like raised behind you? It, does it just matter who goes all in first? Uh, so if someone's already raised, then it's like more likely you going all in. Like it, it, it's more likely they're already committed, so that if you go all in, they won't fold. Okay. So so that is relevant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, Right, so, so, so exactly. So in practice, it's very tricky. And in fact, it can be beneficial if you can somehow convince your opponents that you're not rational. I've never personally done this, but I've heard of people like making a bad call sometimes in a satellite just so people know not to like mess with them, essentially. But I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit weird. So, so it, it is, there is this weird metagame with this traffic intersection type game. Although this is only relevant in like the most extreme ICM situations, which are like satellites. Um, so, I mean, actually, I should say one scenario where I think you could consider folding aces preflop in a normal tournament is actually this. So, let's say, let's say there's 55 until the, let's say 54 get paid and there's 55 left, and you've got one chip and everyone else has thousands of chips, and you know that, like, someone else has already gotten eliminated that hand, so, like, if you fold, you're guaranteed to get in the money, then I would, I would definitely fold aces because even if you win and double up, Congratulations, you now have 10 chips instead of one chip. You, everyone still has thousands of chips. So, so th there are cases where you could construct an extreme case where you should fold aces pre-flop in a tournament, in a normal tournament as well. Okay, so let's get back to the tournament now. Okay, where were we? So, okay, so yeah, so we lost a bunch of chips here. But, um, so the, the next hand we get, we get uh, king eight offsuit. I raise from the button. So we are committed here. I mean, it sucks because our hand sucks, but it's way too good odds to call. And I and ICM is nowhere near that relevant when it's against the small stack. It's the guy you're trying to eliminate. So we call. We get pretty lucky here. Um, so good, good redemption for that terrible Jack Ten hand <laughs> played by me. Okay. So there's three players left. Um, so ICM is still very relevant. We're the second stack, so I'm mean, we're trying not to get in a big all in with this guy. Um, although it's less significant because this guy has still has a decent amount of chips. Like if this guy only had 50,000 chips, then I would try a lot harder to avoid getting in a big pot with Be My Sponsor. Um, so, oops. So yeah, so he raises and LPM box goes all in, takes it down. Uh, so, so this hand, he makes it 3x and I decided to call here with Queen 6 suited, which is which is sort of gutsy, I think, but I think it's in position and it's fairly deep and being able to put ICM pressure on him is reasonable. I think it could have gone either way. Um, I think folding is, folding, is, folding is definitely the safer play, but queen six suited is, is plenty good enough here. So I call. He just checks. Um, he might just be giving up on this board where there's a decent amount of... It's fairly dry, right? So from what I said last class, if the board is fairly dry, where like every hand has something, if you've got absolutely nothing, then there's not even much point to make a bluff. Like if he's got ace-2 offsuit here, so um, he just checks and I bet and he folds. So he probably had like ace-2 offsuit or some hand like that. Next hand we get ace-king. Um, I decided to raise small here once again. So I guess this sort of protects that jack-10 hand. So I mean, you know, if I'm doing this with jack-10, I do need to get it with, do it with good hands as well to protect the times I do have jack-10. Um, unfortunately, he guesses correctly. He, he doesn't fold when I have jack-10 and folds when I have ace-king. Um, so we still take that one down. And we win the blinds the next hand again. So suddenly we're, we're chip leader by a decent margin after those three hands. 9-4 off. I'm not going to call. So fold him. So jack-7. So once again, because of ICM, this guy just goes all in knowing we can't call that much. Takes it down. 7-6 offsuit. I decided to fold. Um, I think that's very reasonable considering they can just go all in on top of that. Queen nine, queen nine off, get a walk. So one thing I should pay attention is I, I do think these guys, by now I've sort of collected enough data points of getting a walk way more often than I should, where I think 
these it's not just a coincidence like i'm conf- statistically confident enough that they're actually just giving me too many walks so when they don't give me a walk i should be i should put them on a stronger range of hands than i normally do um pocket tens we three bet this guy again he gets away again so six two offsuit. So we we've, we've gotten dealt good cards, even though we haven't gotten too much action from them. We're still won a bunch of chips from getting good cards. So Jack four off. I'm gonna fold to this guy. So it's, as you can see, it's it's fairly boring, but I think this is this is how essentially what essentially should happen in the final final couple of people left in the tournament. Ace ten off. Um, so I decide to. So I decided to not go all in here. I guess that would be 27 big, 26 and a half big blinds, which is a bit much. So I decided to just raise small. Um, if he three bets, if he re-raises to say like 60,000, I'm always going all in here. Um, if he goes all in himself, I'm probably, I'm, I'm basically not folding, even though it kind of sucks from an ICM point of view. I think ace-10 offsuit is just way too good. So I'm essentially just raising small, looking for action here. He folds. 7-2 offsuit. Uh, we raise. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so LPM box take, gets a walk. Queen-3 off. We get another walk, which is nice. Uh, Jack-5 off. I, I raise here, which is definitely like an exploitative play. It's definitely not, you know, like definitely from a Nash equilibrium optimal play point of view, this is, there's no way the optimal strategy is to raise a fraction of hands so big that it includes Jack-5 offsuit. But I think at the time I probably told myself this guy was being overly scared. Even though he was playing somewhat aggressive earlier on, he's maybe is over adjusting for ICM as being too, and is respecting me too much in the presence of this short stack. Um, I can look at the HUD stats at the time, although they won't be that accurate uh, because they're going to include all the hands. So, so, th so normally I do play with all these numbers on. Um, so we can see that his, yeah, but this is it's going to be biased because this includes the hands with uh, m with like six or seven people at the table. But it says that he uh, he calls from the big blind like only twenty percent of the time. But but I mean that's not a great. That's out of that's yeah that's gonna be biased so it doesn't it doesn't tell us too much um, but I, I guess at the time I must have told myself I'm gonna try to exploit this guy that's the only way I can see why I, I decided to raise Jack five offsuit here uh, so we got a call but I mean I'm gonna continuation bet we do have a backdoor heart draw and this is our best chance of just winning the pot and I could I could maybe barrel on by barrel I mean bet again as a bluff on a bunch of turns, so I just bet here. Uh, he does fold. <laughs> Next hand with queen nine, we open the button, but we get shoved on, and I guess we have to fold. Queen four, we get another walk. Yeah, so this is actually getting ridiculous. It seems like we've, we've literally gotten like five or six walks in a row, and I would guess probably we should be getting a walk, like less than Less, I guess at a three-handed table it's more often, but still less than like 30% of the time. Yeah. Is it possible you're getting walks because like someone has raised your big blind and you've defended a lot, and so they're scared to raise your big blind? Maybe. I have been fairly active, and but I did fold a bunch of... I did fold some borderline situations, though, like this, uh, like this jack... Uh, I think it was a different jack seven, but um, yeah, maybe. That's possible. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, but, but that's good, right? It's, it's good that we're, like, I'm not complaining that we're getting a lot of them, so. Um, and yeah, and we are the big stack, so in general, you know, it is, it is harder for them to bully us around than us to bully them around, so it does make sense from that point of view, too. I still thought it was just kind of too many, so. Anyway, so I just continue trying to raise a lot, especially against this guy. So Jack 8 offsuit, we take it down. Jack 2, maybe we could have folded, but by now this guy was getting short enough. Like, he's blinded down from 15 and a half big blinds, I think, to 13 and a half. He might have had even more before, like 17, so he might be looking for a spot to shove now. Um, be my sponsor actually raises small here and gets him to fold. Jack 6 off here. 
we got another walk. I should, I should just skip the hands on big blind since nothing ever happens, which is great for us. Um, so pocket threes here, I just go all in. Um, so I talked about this before, but uh, what is like what's sort of a okay? What what's a problem with my with this play in some sense? Reverse imply dogs. Uh, right, right, good. So so yeah. So if I don't do this, if I just raise small, I have bad reverse imply dogs, right? But uh, but one particular issue sort of is every other time we've made it twenty five thousand, and really nothing's changed, and suddenly we go we go all in. So it is. <laughs> You know, it is a bit suspicious where he can, he basically knows we have a hand that has very bad reverse imply dots. He basically knows we have like pocket threes or ace four offsuit or something like that, but it's still sort of hard for him to exploit. Like, you know, I mean, sure, you can call like ace nine and exploit us, but I mean, ace nine is already a great hand. Or, you know, you can call like pocket fours and exploit us, but it's not that easy to get dealt pocket fours or a, big, or a better pair than pocket fours. So, so here, yeah, even though, you know, against a good player, he sort of knows my range is a very small, specific number of hands, it's still hard for him to, like, he can't really just call jack-10 suited here. Uh, maybe he can, but um, probably like jack-9 suited or queen-7 suited he can't call because it's, there's, there's still an off chance we have, like, queen-9 off suit or something, so. Uh, oops. So, anyway, so he does fold, but... It definitely raises suspicion. Jack 10 off. So Jack 10 off, we just go all in here. So I think, um, so this is actually important. So so normally I just raise from the button, but by now the big blind has gotten so short that I'm willing to just go all in. Because the big blind is sort of short enough where even if he picks up a hand and calls and beats me, I'm still the chip leader, even if that happens. So the ICM is, doesn't hurt me that much because, um, yeah, and also just the fact that I'm risking less. And also, not the other important thing of the big blind getting short is now the small blind is much less incentivized to gamble than before. Like before, when the big blind had 180K, you know, he, he was incentivized to gamble against me because um, it, it's not that easy to wait for the big blind to bust. But now that the big blind only has 10K, it's easier to sort of just wait and hope that he busts. So basically, ICM becomes a lot more favorable in both cases, and shoving, I think, is, is very good now with these stack sizes. So we do shove, and we take it down. 9-2 off, so no one usually wants our blinds, but then they both <laughs> want our blinds. Um, LPM box takes it down. So ace two, I just go all in here. Um, basically, same justification as the pocket threes. Eight seven off. I, I think I probably should have raised this. Um, even going all in, honestly, might not be that bad. I'd have to do an exact calculation, but I think probably. I mean, it's not. It's a pretty bad hand, but I think probably I shouldn't be folding, given that I'm the big stack and given that they've both been giving me lots of respect. But. I fold, which can't be a big mistake, but I think probably I shouldn't have folded. Uh, the next hand, LPM box, goes all in, and we fold. Next hand, we get 8-7 suited. So by now, this guy, be my sponsor. So we've just won enough pots where this guy is also sort of short now. So it's a pretty good situation for us from an ICM perspective. They're both kind of short enough where we can just go all in preflop very often, and they have to fold... Um, quite often. Tens of an off is a bit too weak, but I decided to raise. But yeah, this is a bit inconsistent play for my part, because I think for most purposes, 8-7 off is a better hand than 10-7 off, um, but for some reason I raise 10-7 off and fold 8-7 off. Ace-5 suited, we get a walk again. Queen-5 off, yeah, so I just go all in here. I mean, yeah, this is, so this is definitely not a plus chip EV all in, but once again, I think ICM by now is relevant enough where um, it's fine because he just has to fold. We take it down. 10-6 off, I decide to fold. Big blind gets a walk. Get a walk with six deuce, pretty good. Ace-2 off, once again, we just go all in, they fold. 
pocket kings. <laughs> so I raised small. I mean, yeah, so this is a bit suspicious again. Normally I've been going all in. You know, he raises small, obviously, yes, pocket kings. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's basically true. But I mean, also, I think I will do this with some of the weakest hands that I'm not willing to gamble all in with, but still want to raise, like maybe like something like 9 7 offsuit, maybe. But we, we don't bite, so we just um, we take it down. So he goes all in, we fold jack two off suit. Queen three suited, go all in. So I'm gonna go through this fairly fast. There's a lot of the same same stuff. Six five off, we we fold. Because yeah, by now they're sort of short enough where they might actually just call us pretty often. So I fold six five off. So here, pocket threes holds against queen jack. So th so this is an so this is an extreme ICM spot. Um, so he calls here and he does double up. So the next hand we are we do have an extreme ICM spot because this guy only has one big blind. So essentially, the correct strategy is going to be I'm supposed to shove any two cards, and he's only supposed to call. I would guess like maybe like the top top. Seven or eight percent of hands in a situation he normally should be calling like top thirty or something. So I just go all in and like even if he has ace two offsuit, I'm certain he has to fold. Like even if even if he has like say king queen and I turn up my hand and show him jack seven, he probably still has to fold. Just because like he just because he really can't bust. Like yeah, I I, I haven't done the exact math, but you know I wouldn't be that surprised if he told me like. Pocket nines is a full for him. I wouldn't be that surprised. Um, so yeah. So so once again, I go all in because this guy probably can't call. So the, there is so you you do oh, okay. So yeah, we went we went against Ace Queen, which is quite it's kind of crazy that he picked up Ace Queen with one big blind. But we do win. Um, some some players like to do. Uh, do this thing called like cooperative play to get the big blind to bust. So th this is in the history of uh, poker. It's sort of what was almost customary for the players in who have chips in here to basically just all agree to just call and not raise each other and to maximize their chances of busting the big blind. It's sort of a form of cheating in some sense. It's like collusion in some sense. But it's customary maybe like five, six years ago for everyone to do this. Because it sort of benefits everyone else. Um, it sort of benefits all of these guys if they all agree to do this. And uh, it just maximizes the chances that the big blind is eliminated. But the issue with this is, unfortunately, is unfortunately, there is an option to be selfish, right? Unfortunately, if, if you know, if if we both trusted each other completely, we could collude and be like, okay, we're just going to call, check down every flop, turn, and river, no matter what, to mass so that we can both see the river with any two cards and maximize the chances of busting this guy. The issue with this is, you know, players, when you play a game, you're selfish, right? And you want to, you know, if there is an opportunity to bet because you have a good hand, you're going to want to bet. Or like, you know, if there's a draw and you have a good hand, you want to bet to get the other guy to fold. And basically, from a game theoretic perspective, since we have these options, there's no way for us to essentially agree that we're going to just check down and see the river, which is why I consider it collusion if players actually do this. Um, so nonetheless, I do, the, I do the most selfish line, which is just go all in. Um, but yeah, if this guy was my best friend and I wanted to cheat, then I could just call and let him call and then just check it down even if I flop the nut flush. Um, but... Okay, so now it's heads up, and uh, so okay, I'll try to show every hand. Uh, okay, so now ICM doesn't matter, but it would be good to show a bit of heads up play because uh, I don't think we've done do too much heads up play in this class. So we call here, and we check. He makes it 32, and I decided to check raise, check raise bluff this flop. Um, I think I think it's close. I mean, I think I probably shouldn't be folding. I think Jack Six suited is just has too many backdoor draws on this spot to ever fold, just as part of a, a part of my strategy. Um, I think I decided that I wanted my strategy to, to be I'm going to raise good hands like eights and fours, and then I'm going to also raise hands with lots of backdoor draws like Jack Six of Hearts. So I decided to do this. 
Um, so unfortunately, he goes all in. So <laughs> we fold. Doesn't quite work. So queen ten off. We raise. Oh, so one thing I should say is I, I think most of you know this, but once a tournament gets heads up and it's just the small blind and the big blind, the small blind is actually has position. Mm -hmm. So normally when it's small blind against big blind, the big blind has position post flop. But when it's heads up as the small blind, you actually have position. So you're very strongly incentivized to play from the small blind. It's just by far the better position because, um, because you have position and you have to put in less of a blind. Um, so another cheat that, so I'm teaching you guys all these different cheats. Um, another cheat that people used to do, it's not really a cheat, but another sort of angle shoot people used to do back in the day is um, there would be people who like normally play pretty low stakes, let's say like uh, 25 cent, 50 cent. And then they would play, they would sit at these $25, $50 tables. So like where the blinds are 25 bucks, 50 bucks, which is pretty, which is really high stakes for them. And you know, like <laughs> something they really don't, have the bankroll to gamble that, but their strategy basically is if you're the first to sit down, you get to be the dealer on the first hand. So their strategy is basically just um, sit there and then wait for someone else to sit down and then play the first hand as the dealer where they have the, a huge advantage. They can just raise and usually the other guy will fold and they'll win 50 bucks, which is a huge deal to them. Um, and then they'll just leave after the first hand. <laughs> so this is something that happened quite a lot. And then, so, you know, my friends and I, we talked about this, playing a crazy strategy where you would sit down knowing this is what the other guy's going to do and then sit down with him. And, you know, we would have the capital to take on risk and then we would basically just play the first hand extremely aggressively and knowing that the guy has to fold most of the time because if he calls, that's all his money on the site. <laughs> so, so yeah, it led to a lot of weird dynamics. <laughs> but okay, so here we have, but this is a turn, this is why I chose tournaments, not cash games. There's, there's fewer ways to do these weird cheats. Um, so queen 10, we raise, we take it down. Next hand we get ace queen suited. So unfortunately we get a walk. So queen eight, we raise, we take it down. Uh, sorry, he calls. Um, and then it's checked to us. We continuation bet. And he raises, which is weird because it's a flop that's a lot better for my range than his because I can have ace king and ace queen. And even ace jack, I think if he had ace jack, he would have re-raised pre-flop. So in some sense, it's weird because the like it's really hard for him to have, I think, pocket aces or pocket eights or... Like even pocket threes, he probably would have re-raised all in pre-flop. So really, it's like, what do you have, right? It's like, I don't have much, but really, the, it's like, what do you have? So it's it's kind of weird because, you know, I, I expect him to check-raise this flop so rarely that when he does, um, on the one hand, it's just strange, but on the other hand, he must know that. So it's, you know, I'm assuming it's somewhat balanced, and he will occasionally turn up, like, ace three or something here. So... I decided to call and see one more card. I don't know if that's that's great. Like maybe I should have just folded and just believed him, or just like re-raised if I didn't believe him. Um, re-raise essentially as a bluff. Like make it like a hundred thousand and just hope he folds. But I decided to call. The turn is a nine, putting out some straight draws but no flush draws, and he bets fairly big, and I fold. Um, I don't really know how I feel about how I played that hand. I think I mostly played exploitatively. Like I just called the flop because I wanted to see what he did and I folded the turn because maybe based, based on his bet sizing or his bet timing, I just felt like he had it. So I, I'm not sure I'm extremely happy with how I played that hand, but probably just at the time I decided to play exploitatively and try to play best against how I expected him to act. So here with 10-7, with 10-7 off, I decided to re-raise. Um, so this is so the reason I th I re raise a hand as bad as ten seven offsuit. I talked a bit about this la uh, two classes ago about like your pre flop raising strategy. So essentially, what I'm doing is I want to be re raising my good hands and also my hands that I'm not sad if he goes all in and I have to fold and I don't get to see a flop with. So like if I had ten seven suited, that's sort of like too good of a hand and I really don't want to re raise. And then if he goes all in fold my pretty 10-7 suited and not even get to see a flop with it. But 10-7 off suit is a bad enough hand where I'm not that sad if he just goes on and I have to fold. So that's why I'm raising like my good hands and also my sort of weakest possible hands that, I, that I'm that i okay if I don't get to see a flop with. Um, 
He does call, unfortunately, but we do hit a pretty good flop, so I'm just going to bet and get it all in. Uh, heads up, basically any kind of top pair is, in general, just way more than good enough to put all your money in with. He folds, though. So a6, we raise. I'm going to go fairly quickly because I'm running a bit short of time. We continue, we should bet the flop and take it down. Uh, he raises here. I call with king six, which is pretty borderline. I probably, I could have, I mean, I think fold, it's too good a hand to fold, but probably it's too bad a hand to call. Probably I should have just raised um, by the same logic as before. But we call, and I decided to donk out on this flop because I figured there's, a, I mean, there's a number of draws I can have, so, and here I do sort of have a weak draw, like a seven gives me uh, a, a bad straight, but still a very good hand in a two player pot. He calls, and the turn is a jack, which I still have a straight draw, because now a queen gives me a straight. So I, I continue bluffing, um, so he folds, which is good. 6-2 offsuit, I just give one to him. Um, so yeah, I think you should be playing like 90, 90, 95% of buttons, and maybe not that high when it's getting shallower, but like at least 80% of buttons, but 2-3 offsuit is one of the hands I'm okay with folding. 8-5 uh, suited, I'm just check-raising the swapping. Getting it in. He felt so, yeah. Let's say in heads up, you have a, you had an opponent that, like, from the big blind was very likely to three bet you. Yeah. Like, how would you adjust your range, like, opening from the button or the small blind? Oh, okay. So, uh, I mean, if they're, if they're, so if they're really loose, you would basically raise only your, like, good hands that you're hoping they re raise on with. And so, like, would that be for maybe sixty percent of your hands, like down from eighty, or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you would you would basically raise less. I just have more value essentially. Right. Yeah. It's like hard to calibrate that range, though. As what's like a good. Hand yeah, hand yeah. Hand. And also, another thing you can do is call more. Uh, I don't think it gets relevant in this heads-up match, but sometimes it gets shallow enough where you actually want to have a calling range pre-flop from the button. Um. So, okay, so King Ten. So okay, so okay, so I do call here. Um, I think I, I essentially call thinking I would call if he went all in, but also just to make it so that I can also sometimes call a hand like 10-4 offsuit, and he can't just shove any two and expect me to fold. So I decided to call here. Um, we got a great flop, so I, I check it back as a slow play. Um, he checks again on the turn, so I bet he calls. The river he leads out quite big, and uh, I, I just call because I think raising I'll usually only get called by better. Um, and he actually turns up a flush here, so it's a weird hand. I mean, it seems like we could have lost a lot more, but I'm not saying our opponent played the hand badly, but we were very lucky to lose this little when we have, you know, two pair against a flush, and we only lost essentially like four big blinds or something. It's, I guess I'll be happy to get away with that. Uh, okay, I'll probably I'll probably run like uh, two or three minutes over time. I'll try to hurry, but uh, I don't want to not finish the tournament today. So we fold this. Maybe I'll skip forward a bit to some of the bigger pots. Um, so what happened here? So we raise jack six. He goes all in. We fold. All right, let's go do this one. Okay, so. King, so okay, so the match has gone on for a bit. Uh, he's won a bunch of pots. He's catching up. He's catching up. Uh, king three off. We raise. He calls. So here the flop I think is. So once again, it's a situation where I don't think he he ever has an ace. Um, so I'm basically betting a hundred percent. He calls. The turn's another ace, which is is a bad card for us because now it's less likely we have an ace. But um, so but normally it's, I still think it's a fine spot to bluff just because he. It's, he essentially can't have an ace, and we can. But I think king high is good enough here where I'm going to win the pot by checking it down with my king high often enough that bluffing is super superfluous. So I just check. And it's checked down, and he was actually trapping with king nine here. Um, so he wins that one. Yeah, and probably he wouldn't have folded. Like, let's say I, I bet the turn and sh went all in on the river. Probably he has to call just because it's, like, almost the best hand he can possibly have. It pretty much is the best hand you can possibly have, um, other than maybe like 7-6, but... Uh, I think nothing happens there, so... Let me see. Okay, so yeah, we lose a bunch of pots because we raise and he goes, he re-raises and we fold. Um, so things 
aren't looking too good. Oh, so I actually made sort of a hero fold here. Um, I, I think, once again, this is an exploitative play. I would probably never fold this, like, from an optimal strategy point of view. I think an ace in heads up with only 20 big blinds is way too good. But he did just re-raise me two hands ago, and I don't know, I think at the time I just felt like he almost certainly had it when he did this, so I made an exploitative, I made an exploitative fold um, based on what I thought he had. Uh, so the next hand he raises, we go all in with pocket fives, and we've never heard of five in the ace jack, which is pretty sweet. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was very surprised. I was basically ready to just leave, and I was, I was probably in some other tournaments, but I basically was ready to close the table and focus on the other tournaments, but somehow we get there. Um, and then the tournament just is easy from there. We get ace nine, we go all in, he folds, and then he goes all in into our pocket sixes, and we hit a street, so we win. Um, <laughs> all right, cool. Yeah, so, so okay, so yeah, so I played through all the hands in a tournament. Uh, once again, yeah, there's a lot of selection bias there, but hopefully you learned some stuff from that. Uh, so there's two classes left. Next class, I'll sort of wrap up uh, the theory and the exact poker examples. I'll talk a bit more about cash games and show you how to play when you're like, really deep and talk about like post-flop raising. And then Friday, we have a guest lecture from Bill Chen, which should be really exciting. Uh, he always talks about very interesting stuff. So I'll see you guys around. Yeah.